Thank you. I actually, uh, uh, I actually changed my, um, in reaction to the uh, discussions over the last few days, I, uh, the last couple of days, I've changed my thing as I went along, but luckily I didn't have time to change it after listening to Winnie's uh, last presentation or I'd have an entirely different uh, program to respond to all of the stuff she said. I, I, I believe that we should um, not integrate social care and medical care. I'll just say that in passing. Uh, uh, and to explore it, I would say if you're going to have a discussion uh, about what to do for a patient with a doctor on one side of the table and a social worker on the other side of the table, who's going to win? If you make social, if you integrate social care and medical care, medical care dominates everything, and uh, often, as often as not, the social care solutions are are preferable, but they won't get heard in an integrated system. So that's just an opinion, uh, and um, we can debate it at, a, at another time. And I'm not going to do it now. Uh, let me start by uh, asking, uh, in general, why is long-term care a problem? Well, high-income nations, uh, looking historically, high-income nations have faced three big trends uh, over the decades. Uh, first, rapid increases of older people. Uh, many of the older people, 10 to 20 percent of people over the age of 65, depending on how you define it, are uh, frail. Uh, at the same time, we have a decline in the traditional family supports with fewer children, with lower co-residents, with more women working, and with changing values about whether people should be dedicating their lives to take care of, of family members. The third factor is that we've had growing strains on the healthcare system and on other programs, including welfare systems and housing, uh, that are struggling with these growing numbers of frail older people that are not well taken care of through the uh, traditional system. So nearly all the OECD countries I exclude uh, my own country, the United States, which is sadly behind in this area, but most of them have expanded LTC and many of them have started comprehensive specialized LTC programs, which by and large have, have worked out very well. Oh dear. Uh, so, I, I'm sorry, now I'm confusing myself. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Why is LTC a problem? What is, let's start with, uh, what is long-term care? Uh, long-term care, I just, I'm, mostly I want to talk about what isn't long-term care. Long-term care is assisted in daily living activities and functional living activities for frail older people. It's not income support, it's not medical care, curative medical care, it's not housing, it's not welfare, it's not lots of other things. When we talk about long-term care programs, this is, is what we're talking about. Who is going to do it? Older people, and a given older person is not able to go to the toilet or isn't able to do this or that or the other thing, and they need some help. Who's going to provide the help? Spouses. You can take it for granted. It doesn't always work, but generally speaking, so long as there are spouses, they're going to do it. That's not particularly problematical. The problem is there aren't always spouses or they're old themselves. Children. Well, that's a possibility. Unskilled domestic workers that you hire, usually foreign migrants that come and live in your house, and take care of people, right? Then, or the possibility of trained and supervised staff people working for agencies who come for your, to your home and provide home help, or community-based facilities like daycare and other things, right? Or you go into an institution, a nursing home, a hospital, or something. Those are the only possibilities. I mean, you could talk about community and neighbors and so forth or other, but it's a, it's a pipe dream to think that they're, they can be very helpful on the, in friendly visiting and supplementary sorts of things, but they're not going to deliver these main services of helping these people, which is hard work, and it has to be paid, either it has to be relatives or it has to be paid for by somebody. Now, there are all kinds of different arrangements of who does it, the mix, mixes of who does these things, uh, and how the people are organized and how they're paid. I'm not going into any detail at all on this. It's true that NGOs and community groups, as well as commercial for-profit providers, can, can play a big role in all these things, but in the, developed, in the developed world, it seems to me, it's become clear that for this stuff to work well, government has to take the lead, and unified programs rather than fragmented programs, to totally agree with Winnie, are, are the better way to do it. Now, to shortcut it a bit, I think of that as a comprehensive uh, LTC program. 
Now, I think that's a very easy case to make for OECD for rich countries. For middle income countries, it's a little harder to make, but I still think that it's compelling because all the middle income nations, Asia or elsewhere, they all face exactly these same trends. They all have more older people, they all have declining family supports for all the same reasons, and they all have strains on their existing social systems because of these numbers of frail older people. And my argument is that if you can make a rational response early, and here again I echo the two previous presentations both said this, you can preempt fragmented responses, basically market kind of responses that get expensive and become vested interests. And I'll give you a very brief Japanese explanation, uh, uh, example, which is back in 1973, for very good political uh, reasons, uh, the Japanese government installed something that was called in Japanese, the lovely title, Rojin Iryohi Murioka, or the uh, uh, making all, old people's medical expenses free. Hospital or long-term care, or hospital care, or outpatient care used to have a 50% copay for older people and they took away the copay. What was the result? Older people flowed into hospitals. Everybody thought Japanese are traditional, they love family care. They didn't love family care. Many of them put their old person, whether it was the family or the old person, but they went into hospitals. So, these, so doctors went out and built all these small crappy little hospitals to fill all these old people up, right? And people got used to thinking that hospital care was normal for long-term care. And doctors, uh, and then we got a big established interest group of all these long-term care hospitals, of, of which there's no use for them whatsoever in a medical or social sense, uh, that, are, that, that are there, you know. And so then what do you do about it? Well, ask the Japanese right now. We're 40 years after that period, and they're still trying to get people, way, way too many people in hospitals for more than three months. 400,000 people in Japan. Other OECD countries, nobody's in the hospital for longer than months, but in Japan, lots of them are being paid for out of health insurance. It screws up the statistics because they don't usually get counted in long-term care because they're being paid out of health insurance, but it is pure and simple long-term care. So there's a real lesson to that because you, you, the mistakes you make early on bring actors into, the, into this that become established interests and you can't get rid of them later. It's harder and harder to do, so you want to, you if you can possibly start out right, it's a good idea. Uh, and uh, the, not only will they stick around, but then they'll start. We heard about Malaysia earlier. The problem is we've got means-tested programs for poor people and then market programs for rich people. What happens to all the people in the middle? Exactly the right question. What happens to the people in the middle? Do you bring from the bottom up? Do you start expanding your pro public-based egalitarian programs for these people in the middle? Or do you let the market forces the, the uh, hotshot, luxurious nursing homes and all those people leach themselves down into taking over that group. And then once they get them over, they realize they can't really pay it. So they're going to come to the government and, subs and ask for big subsidies so that they can pay for their profitable services to deliver to these things. And all the economists think, gee, this is a market solution. It's going to be much more efficient. But it's not. It's the opposite of efficient. Is it practical to start early? Middle income cl countries clearly have a lot of competing priorities. But early entry has the advantages that with few old people and with traditional support still working pretty well, I had this discussion in Thailand and they thought it made sense, you can, your demand is still pretty low for a comprehensive LTC system. You can put one in and it doesn't cost very much because not many people are using it. And then you start at a smaller base, you build competence in workforce, in facilities and so forth, out of experience, you, you have a trial and error, you can build the program up for when the demand really expands. And I will say, if there are any potential political leaders here, nothing is more popular than saying the government's going to do something to help families and older people uh, receive uh, some decent care. It really flies very well. So I think it's very practical. Now, there's a lot of variety in long-term care programs among high-income in nations. When you look to try to explain it as a social science, where, where does the variety come from? Largely depends on earlier choices. Countries that had big social insurance programs, like Germany and Japan, tend to do with social insurance. Countries that use tax-based local government-run systems, like the UK and Scandinavia, they tend to do it that way. I personally think uh, that the Japanese model has a lot to offer. Uh, Korea has adopted, as we'll hear shortly, something much like the Japanese model. And Taiwan would like to, although it's not clear that they can do it for a particular reason. But it, it, it does have its, its, uh, its good sides. And I'll turn now, if this thing will work, to uh, describe it a little bit. Japan's universal long-term care insurance system. It provides institutional and community services to help frail older people 
and their caregivers. Uh, eligibility for benefits is based only on your disability level. It has nothing to do with your income, rich or poor. It has nothing to do with your family situation, whether there's somebody, uh, your spouse or your children at home to take care of you. That's, that's a social insurance type system. The financing comes half from premiums in a dedicated program. Premiums are paid by everybody over the age of 40, including everybody over the age of 65, like my wife and myself, who actually pay a fair amount every month for our long-term care insurance premiums. The benefits are quite generous uh, in Japan. Uh, they all come with a 10% uh, copay. Uh, you pay, the recipient pays 10% of the value of the services uh, that they use. So what services are covered? Oh, that's interesting. Why are we doing this? At-home services include uh, home help, uh, people who come to your house for, to do housekeeping chores or to do what's day, body care or, or personal care services, uh, and for that matter, come to your house and do rehabilitation. Uh, they'll come to your house and give you a bath, a special thing in Japan, kind of a cultural sort of a thing. Remodel your house or uh, rent you a wheelchair or other assisted devices. Outside of the home, daycare, very highly developed in Japan. Three or four days a week you go for six or eight hours, usually eight hours a day, picked up by a van, come back in a van, take a bath, eat lunch, social activities, uh, exercise, and so forth. Also, uh, daycare with rehabilitation added, uh, short stay or night care or respite care, three or four days a month, for example, or something like that in a nursing home uh, so that the family caregiver at home gets a break. Uh, and then uh, institutional care include nursing homes and other things that are kind of like, uh, uh, more or less like nursing homes with a little more medical care attached. And there's another category called quasi-institutions, which means Japan will pay the caregiving costs in private nursing homes and also in dementia group homes. Uh, they pay the caregiving costs and the, the client pays the hotel costs or the, the room and board costs. So it's a little bit complicated, but in essence, it's not so bad. Uh, the process that works this way, uh, you apply to your municipal office. If you think you're eligible, they do an assessment with a 79-item questionnaire based on, mostly on ADLs. Um, you're categorized into one of seven levels, or 2 to 3 percent of people, that's all, are rejected altogether. Uh, the, the decision is reviewed by an independent comp committee that includes a doctor. The client selects a care manager. And either with the care manager or on her own, she selects uh, the providers uh, that she wants, uh, her choice, or his or her choice, of what kind of services she wants, uh, up to an, an amount of money, a ceiling for the value of those services that depends on the category of need they're in, which, which of the seven categories. The services are provided, they're paid directly for the municipality. The care coordinator keeps, the care manager keeps the records, coordinates the services, uh, communicates, for example, with doctors and whatever, the home doctor if needed, and uh, modifies the plan as they go along. After two years, you're reassessed, or if you think your condition has deteriorated, you can ask for an earlier reassessment, move up a grade, and become entitled to more services. How is the program managed? Um, municipalities are the insurance carriers. Uh, they oversee the program. Uh, however, it's sort of local in that way, and there are local variations, but the national regulations dominate the program, so it's not like what's referred to as the postal code lottery in England, where what town you live in, the amount of services you can get are vary greatly by geography in England and in Sweden and elsewhere. In Japan, it really doesn't make much difference. There's not much local autonomy. For community care-based care, not institutions, but for community-based care, the providers can be for-profit companies, and for the, most of them are. Uh, act, not great big chains, but smaller for-profit companies, but also nonprofit NGO organizations and even governmental organizations. They compete uh, for the business, but it, all the prices are fixed on a price schedule, so they're the same every place in a given, in a given area. Uh, and so they can't compete on price, so they compete on perceived quality, whatever that is. Your neighbor said they liked it, you think they're cute, they have a nice van, it's a little more convenient, or you think the services are good, but people can change it, and they change it all the time. They'll change their home help agency, they'll change, if their home help agency sends a different home helper every time, they say the heck with that, they call another agency and see if they can get one that'll send the same one all the time, or they go to a different daycare. So in that sense, that's the main, there is licensing and so forth, but it is the main quality control 
uh, element is this kind of competition. Distinctive aspects of the Japanese system include these. First, the system only covers older people. Younger disabled people are in a different separate system. This is actually somewhat unusual in the world. Usually they're lumped together. I think lumping them together is a mistake because their needs are very different. Second, and this is the biggest factor, Japan provides services only. It does not provide any cash allowance. So all you can get is, is formal services. The third point is that the Japanese system is pretty generous. And in that sense, it may not be a great model for middle income countries looking to build up a system because it's, 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 it's pretty expensive. Germans only spend about half as much with a system that's rather similar. Why is the difference? In Japan, they're so, their standards are so easy that 18% of the over 65 population qualifies for getting these benefits. It's only 11% in Germany. Well, half of the people aren't, in Japan aren't even eligible for benefits in, in Germany. So that's one aspect. The other is the benefits in Japanese are pretty high. They assess, they cover 90% of assessed need. The 10% is the copay. In Germany, they only cover 50% of assessed need. That's both in institutions and in community-based care. But the system works pretty good in Germany. For me, a rich country like Japan, I think they can afford this kind of expenditure, but they could do the German system at those levels of expenditure, and people would also be relatively happy about it. Or they would have if they'd started from zero. Japanese problem was they had a different system uh, start from 1990 to 2000 called the Gold Plan that had relatively rich benefits and easy accessibility and politically they thought they couldn't cut back on it very much so they, that's the, one of the main reasons why they have such high things. The final issue, the long-term care system is its own independent system. It is not subservient to the medical care establishment and that is one of its strongest points. It's its own system that sets its own priorities there's a lot of cooperation between the medical care system and the long-term care system. Not enough. There's not enough any place. But the idea that you get more cooperation when you integrate than when you have separate systems that both have a strong basis to build on and then cooperate, I think is just flatly wrong. The integrated systems don't work very well. And they, they don't work hardly anywhere in the world. The seven cases are good cases in that King's in that King's Fund report, they're interesting cases, but those are very small scale little experiments. There's no country in which long-term care and medical care is effectively integrated. The closest is the United States. And that's awful. That's the worst system in the world. Okay, the impact. LTCI has had a great impact on frail older people and on their family caregivers. In particular, the expansion of community-based services has been remarkable. Uh, you can just read these numbers. 2001 is the second year of the program after the startup had already occurred. Uh, these are in uh, 1,000 people, so 500,000 to a million and a half people getting home care. Even much larger numbers in daycare. I'm sorry, you just wave at the thing and it changes. You can touch anything. Um, lots of people use wheelchairs and other assisted devices. These are the, that's up by 5.7 times. I don't understand why that does that. I guess you can't even wave at it. Visiting nurses are not up so much. <laughs> dementia group homes is smaller, but that's 178,000 people in these dementia group homes, which are terrific institutions. Uh, and then nursing homes have not gone up so much, from about 600,000 to about uh, 900,000. Um, uh, a growth, but not as much growth, because they have tried to uh, emphasize uh, community care. Problems and prospects in the Japanese system. Sustainability. The finance ministry and the Ministry of Finance and the Liberal Democratic Party, and the people who love them, like public finance scholars and so forth, conservatives, economists, they all say, the program's out of control, it's way too big, it's crazy, we can't do it, grows too fast. In fact, it's grown a lot uh, since 2000 when it started, up by two and a half times in that, to 2012. That's uh, about $80 billion a year. $80 billion a year is a lot of money. It's about 1.7% of GDP. For a country with all the old people Japan has, that strikes me as being reasonable, but it's a lot of money. There's no question about it. In process terms, every three years, the financial system, the, the, the finances of the long-term care system are reviewed. It's, it's in a process that is needed to set the premiums for the next three-year period, but it means you review it, and it's the time the government always takes to try and cut down on expenses. Uh, and they introduce various cost control mechanisms. These have actually been pretty effective, particularly the reform of 2006 uh, uh, that, that made various changes. 
Uh, and the result of it was that since that time, you'll see in the early years, this is actually 201, 202, 203, my inept Excel abilities meant I couldn't write the actual dates down there, but that's what it is. And uh, you'll see that it was growing in the first few years of the program and everybody panicked. So they, they changed it and they did reform several things. And since then, this is divided by the over 75 population, which has been going up very rapidly, but spending per over 75 person in the population, not recipients, but in the population, has been relatively stable, which is about as good as you can, unless you really want to cut back on the program, which they don't, that's about as good as you can do. I think it's a real policy success. What are the prospects for sustainability? Well, there's going to be a reform a year from now. It's already pretty much planned, although it hasn't been passed by the legislature yet. And what they're going to do is double the copay for higher income people from 10 to 20 percent. They're going to for the first time in Japan, look at people's assets as well as income in deciding whether to subsidize their hotel costs and in institutions. Uh, and they're going to move some of the lighter needed people. This is how it's going to work is hard to say, but they're sort of moving them out of the main program, the light need people, and move them into a different program run as municipal governments rather than being such an insurance based kind of program. Not sure it will work. It doesn't matter that much because the lower need people only take 5.7% of the expenses anyway, so it, it doesn't matter that much. But the real key, this is a, I'm a political scientist. As a political scientist, the key is every three years they have to do something. Because the conservatives and the mine industry are storming around saying it's too much, too much, too much money, too much money. You have to respond to it. So you respond to it in a way, it may work pretty well, it may not work that well, but it has to look plausible. And it has to seem to be doing something about the growth rate of expenditures. By three years later, you know, you do it again, or maybe six years later, uh, which happened after 2006. But you just have to keep managing this. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to keep managing it for that much longer, uh, which I'll get to in just a minute. A little known fact. Adequacy program. The general public, the Asahi Shimbun, NHK, the media, everybody, they think LTCI is a great program. It's very popular. But they think it doesn't do enough. There are long waiting lists for places in nursing homes. That's a fact. Uh, Community-based care is seen as fine, but it doesn't do enough. The burdens on family caregivers are still too high. That's the normal thing. If you read the Japanese papers from week to week, you'll see one story after another uh, that's, that's making this, this case. Uh, in fact, the levels of service provision are pretty high in Japan. Comparing long-term care insurance spending or programs is extremely difficult. I've been doing a project for the last two years trying to do it. I don't report it because it isn't published yet, but uh, I'll give you some old data that's from a European source, the European Center. These data are admittedly not very good, and they're also outdated. They're the mid-2000s. But as they give you a general idea here, the Japan data is in red because they're my numbers. They weren't in the original survey. But Japan is in the same ballpark as these other places as far as institutions. Japanese all think the program, European countries all have much bigger programs, but they don't. Japanese program is actually relatively uh, generous, incidentally. The home care in England is now down to probably around 8%. They've cut it back sharply in the last few years. Um, so what are the first year prospects for adequacy? People would love Japan to build more nursing homes. They all want to move their families. They still want their old people to go into nursing homes. The government's not going to do it. It's just too expensive. Uh, instead, they plan to improve the services for people at home. Uh, the big push right now is various kinds of senior housing with uh, services attached. Uh, they have various models for that, uh, developing 24-hour availability, 24 availability for both long-term care and also at-home medical services. There's a point where integration at the point of service is, is quite important. Uh, and third, they're trying to mobilize community support by taking the local government leads to get uh, community organizations to participate in all this. I don't know how well it's going to work, but that's, that's what they're talking about. Third problem, dementia. Dementia is a gigantic problem everywhere. Many countries have put a lot of resources into cures, attempted cures, drugs or others for dementia. Japan has not done very much with that, but Japan is a leader in care. And for example, uh, two Scandinavian ideas for caring for demented people are much more developed in Japan. Alzheimer's group homes, uh, as I said, 178,000 places now and still growing. Uh, and then daycare, which for community-based services for people living at home, Daycare is really the only thing that works very well for dementia patients. Home help doesn't do a heck of a lot of good. 2.4 million users, 7% of 
everyone over the age of 65 in Japan is now attending daycare. That's at least 10 times any other country uh, in the world. So in that sense, Japan is kind of reasonably well poised, but it's not to say it's not a gigantic problem. And Japan is putting a lot of emphasis on early identification, just a short stay, because they have too many people in mental hospitals uh, still. So just a short stay in a medical facility, build up a plan, base it on community-based support, a volunteer program in the community for Alzheimer's supporters who learn a little about the disease and can you know, find somebody wandering around and they know what to do with them, and that sort of a thing. <coughs> Japan's real weak point in this area, in my mind, is that they do very little of what are interventions to support family caregivers uh, psychologically or with skills or training. Uh, research by Zarat and others in the United States has shown that these are, can be very, very effective uh, I including in postponing institutionalization and so forth, it doesn't fit very well into the Japanese system, and they don't have hardly any psychologists or social workers to do it, so they haven't pushed it, but this is an area uh, that really needs more attention. The workforce problem. In 2012, Japan had about 15 million people over the age of 75. They had about a million and a half caregiving staff. Uh, by 2025, they're going to have seven and a half more million 75-year-old uh, people, uh, they're going to need about another 800,000 care workers. The government's talking about this now. They say they need another million. I don't see why, but anyway, 800,000. It's not a very attractive job. It's hard work. There are few promotions. It's low pay. Uh, the pay is better, and the conditions are better than in many other countries, but it still is, you know, they're not great jobs, uh, long-term care primary, primary level jobs. What are the prospects? An epic-making event on April 4th, two weeks ago, the government, the cabinet, said uh, it's going to consider, which means more or less it's going to do it, I think, uh, allowing foreign caregivers, foreign-born migrant workers to come in Japan and deliver care. Construction workers, caregivers, to some extent child care people are the categories that they're looking at because they're short of labor as the economy improves a little bit. Not many young people. So that doesn't mean live-in assistants or maids as we know them in Singapore and Hong Kong and other places. Uh, it's probably going to be some kind of paid staff with some kind of training and some kind of supervision. I don't know. It's hard to do that. I don't know how they're going to do it. It's hard for Japan to compete with other countries where the language barriers are lower and so forth to attract these uh, people, these uh, basically young women from the Philippines and, and, uh, and other uh, Indonesia and other countries. <coughs> so I don't know if it'll work. In any case, most of these workers are going to have to come from Japan and better pay and, condi better pay and conditions and uh, efforts to reduce the, the high turnover rates, numbers of large, large numbers of people that leave the jobs, uh, is going to be uh, important. Finally, I want to make just two, I'm not, God knows I'm not a demographer. Uh, who's our friend, the demographer, who always said, uh, in, at Michigan? Al Hermelin, you probably know Al Hermelin. Al Hermelin always used to introduce his talks by saying, well, I wanted to be an accountant, but I didn't have the personality, so I became a... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Al, Her Al Hermelin said that. But here are two demo demographic notes that I think some of you might find interesting because they're not often thought of. The first one is, we all think Japanese population is going up. We've seen a variety of this picture about 10 times already here, right? Here's Japan going zoom, zoom, zoom all the way up to 2050. Now, that's the ratio, the percentage of people over the age of 65 in the population, and it's very important. It's important for the economy, the dependence ratio, it's important for supply of caregivers. But for the long-term care programs and facilities, it's not the percentage of old people, it's the absolute number of old people. And that's a different picture. And here it is. The blue line is all the population under 64 and younger. Right? And the red line is the population in absolute numbers in millions of people uh, over the age of 65 and over. What is happening to that number? It's flattening out this year. Aging in that sense, is Japan is over. The number of old people is not increasing in Japan anymore. The number of young people is going down, which is maybe the main problem, but it's interesting to know that the number of older people is not increasing in Japan. Actually, 65 is not a very meaningful number when it comes to long-term care. That's almost all for people over the age of 75. Uh, 
uh, uh, so we need to look at the trend for the age 75 population. So the lines on the bottom I took out, and the, uh, uh, the dark blue line are the people age 66, I'm sorry, 65 to 74. Uh, I'm sorry, the red line is, the, the blue line is the people over the age of 75. As you might well imagine, that's not peaking this year, that's peaking 10 years from now but then after that, it levels out. So what people are saying in Japan now that are in this business, not getting caregivers, that's a different story, but as far as getting the program set up, getting them working right, getting the administration going, we've got 10 really rough years. While the number of over 75 people continues to go up, we're gonna to have to deal with it. After that, we can relax a little. Things aren't gonna be as bad. We have to maintain them, but we don't have to keep uh, increasing them and life will get a little easier. Finally, the last one, aging in Japan is now urban. We have an image of Japan that all the old people are all out on the farms and they're all in these rural areas. And it's true in cross-sectional terms, the percentage of older people in urban areas in Japan, the percentage over 65 in urban areas runs these, it's still high, I mean, but it runs 20, 23, 25%. Many urban areas, it's up over 40%. Everybody's old in these, in these rural villages. So we all think of it as being a rural issue, but it's not in the future. It's all urban. The uh, growth rate of the new over 75 people are all going to be in urban areas. And uh, I have a chart for that too, or a table, not very well constructed. Uh, the red one are the top three prefectures. The black ones are the bottom three prefectures in terms of uh, um, basically urbanization. And we see that the number of over 65 people is going up by 75% in Tokyo. 69% in Kanagawa, 68% in Osaka. Uh, the numbers, and you know, those are uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, there. And in Yamagata, Totori, Shimane, in these rural places, 20,000 people, 17,000 people, not very many at all. So it's going to be the, the action in Japan now is all an urban question. What do we do with these older people over the age of 75 needing care in cities? And it's an interesting perspective because. In this regard, Japan looks more like Singapore or Hong Kong. The issue is all really in what do we do in the big cities, and like in Singapore and Hong Kong, a lot of the things you have to think about is housing and those sorts of related issues, uh, a little different than from rural areas. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I do have one little final slide saying Japan, long-term care is the only social policy area where Japan is clearly a world leader. I wouldn't say the world leader, but it's clearly one of the the best countries in the world are the most generous, the biggest systematic system that works very well. Uh, it's because political leaders saw the problems of having so many frail older people. It's an important problem, the national level. It's an important problem to individuals, so it was a potent political problem. It was difficult to solve, but they went ahead and de de dealt with it. And in my view, Kaigo Hoken has been an effective system. It has some tough problems, but it's clearly a sustainable system and I think a good model for uh, other places. Thank you very much. Um, I was told just before John spoke uh, by Albert, the organizer, that I have to be ruthless. <laughs> but uh, as we are in East Asia, I believe in Confucius. And Confucius says that we have to solve problems with kindness and generosity. So uh, my way of uh, interpreting uh, this is that we're not going to have any questions because you all deserve coffee. And we have a half hour panel at the end, so because we have to catch up uh, and we are very, very over time, uh, we will finish with coffee and then we'll go to Sunman with Korea, Albert with China. No questions either, and please uh, finish your presentation in 20 25 minutes, and then we'll keep all the questions till. The end when Rachel will be chairing the discussion uh, for all these uh, three presentations and more. So, coffee, 4.30 please. I could have sworn you were going to say, my wife Ruth is here, and I thought she were saying, she couldn't say anything, so we're therefore being ruthless, but it wasn't. <laughs>